Welcome to Balancing the Ledger, where tech and finance intersect. I'm Jen Vietchner. And I'm Robert Hackett. And we are very lucky to be joined by Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple. Thanks so much for being here, Brad. Thanks for having me. So you've had a lot of updates this year with Ripple um, and RippleNet, which is your blockchain that uh, many financial institutions are using. Can you give us an update on what's going on and how they're using it, who's using it? Absolutely. So I think, uh, I mean, Ripple, I think, has been really fortunate in the context of the broader blockchain and crypto ecosystem. We've been very focused on a specific customer set, a specific problem around cross-border payments. We've been selling into banks and financial institutions for a few years now. We've signed up over 200 banks and financial institutions globally. Uh, you know, recent ones we've talked a little bit about with things like MoneyGram. We announced a very big partnership with uh, in, I guess, June. They went live uh, in July and August, and actually even in their earnings call in August, we're talking about you know, how they're tangibly seeing the benefits of using XRP to help facilitate their liquidity needs. So we feel really good about the momentum we have there. Uh, and you know, even this week announced some partnerships in the uh, crypto-specific area with BitPay, uh, a company that allows you to use cryptocurrencies to check out at like uh, a PayPal checkout or Visa checkout. Uh, now we'll be supporting XRP and CoinMe, an ATM network that'll also be supporting XRP going forward. So excited about both of those. And if I understand correctly, MoneyGram is actually using XRP in its transactions, which marks a big evolution for you because there are some financial institutions who are using Ripple but not actually XRP. Can you explain how that evolved and how that's yeah. going? So I think you know a lot of times, you know, I talk about the, the more than 200 banks and financial institutions we're working with. Most of them sign up and engage us on a fiat to fiat basis. You know, dollar to yen, dollar to Mexican peso, dollar to Argentinian peso, uh, and it, that's because that's how the correspondent banking network works today. In effect, some people describe what Ripple's original product and initial product is called kind of Swift 2.0. Swift is what correspondent banks use for messaging to debit and credit the pools of liquidity. And when I say pools of liquidity, I mean like pre-funded accounts. The Bank of Jen and the Bank of Brad would have accounts at each other's banks, and you might be Mexican pay, so I'd be dollar, and we'd debit and credit those with messaging. That works if the accounts are pre-funded. And what we have found and is there's more efficient ways to manage liquidity. If you as a bank don't have to put money at my bank and I don't have to put money at your bank, I can use that money for other things. It's working capital. You know, MoneyGram, as an example, has uh, several hundred million dollars of negative working capital. They're a public company. You know, that's material to their business for sure. If by working with them, they can reduce the amount of prefunding that is very accretive to how they think about the use of capital and what they can do with that if they didn't have that negative uh, working capital out there. And if some of the hesitation from some of these financial institutions is that XRP being a cryptocurrency has some added volatility risk as opposed to you know, fiat currency, dollars, pesos, whatever it might be, how do you get over that or, or how do you overcome that risk? It turns out this is a risk that is a little bit of a red herring and it's born of, uh, I'll use Bitcoin as an example, a Bitcoin transaction uh, has taken as long as you know, eight or 10 hours on you know, highly uh, intense days of activity on the, the Bitcoin blockchain. So if you have to hold Bitcoin for eight hours while you settle a transaction, that's a lot of volatility risk. An XRP transaction is always about four seconds long. So if you're only holding a highly volatile asset for three or four seconds versus holding fiat, a low volatile asset, for a swift transaction, maybe three days, it turns out the volatility risk, because it's such a short amount of time, is lower using an XRP transaction than it is using a SWIFT transaction that might take three days. Now, I, I think people don't really understand that today, and part of the, the misinformation and education for us is helping people understand that. Uh, but I think that's you know, part of the, the crawling and walking and run as crypto goes from, I think, kind of the shadows, frankly, into how do we solve real problems for real customers at scale? Well, one thing to jump off of that point, you know, stable coins are all the rage right now. Everybody's coming out with a dollar backed or some other sort of asset backed uh, coins that they can conduct trades quickly, seamlessly, but also without the volatility. Uh, so what would be the advantage of using XRP, for instance, rather than using, you know, one of these more sort of like designed to be fully stable assets? Yeah, a stable coin like USDC, for example, that Coinbase and Circle have done. Uh, I, I think that is interesting in mitigating vol volatility uh, but you still have to go from dollar to peso, right? So at some point you have a bridge, somebody has to bridge that. And in effect, what Ripple's doing is, let's make XRP the most efficient, the most liquid, and the easiest to bridge by selling effectively the connectors on both ends, selling APIs to allow people to connect to both ends of that. Uh, you know, if we have hundreds of banks interconnected 
to use XRP for that, I think that bodes well for the liquidity of XRP. It's basically who has the most liquidity is going to win this game. I mean, that's what I believe. I think different people believe different things, but that's okay. You have all these financial institutions who are now using XRP. It sounds like more people are using it, and yet the price has declined this year recently. Why do you think that is? I think if I could predict the price of crypto, I would uh, be, not, not be here. I, I mean, the, the crypto markets are hard to predict for sure. And yet, uh, in many cases, even now, the altcoin basket is very correlated. Uh, and so when I say altcoin, I mean you know, everything but Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin out, has outperformed the rest of the crypto industry this year. You know, what that looks like in the future, hard to predict. I think over the long term, meaning two, three, four, or five years, you know, the, the, that correlation, I think, will start to reflect those that have a real use case. You know, I'm very enthusiastic about not just what Ripple is doing, but the community of companies working around the XRP ledger. Uh, you know, Coil is a very interesting company doing something around micropayments using XRP, where you really can't use something like Bitcoin for the purpose of micropayments in terms of the cost per transaction or speed of the transaction. It's much more uh, appropriate for, uh, for XRP. There's a lawsuit hanging over Ripple right now. A group of uh, people are saying that XRP and Ripple are sort of tied together and that they, you know, XRP could consider it an unregistered security. Um, what would you say to them? Well, it's pending litigation, so I'll probably be a little bit, uh, you know, muted on the topic. Uh, suffice it to say, you know, we don't think it has merit. Uh, you know, these are people who didn't buy XRP from us. Uh, you know, we also don't believe XRP is a security. Uh, I think, you know, one of the poignant arguments in my point of view is, you know, if I went back to the office and said to the team at Ripple, hey, we're shutting down, XRP trades on 130, 140 exchanges around the world. XRP would keep trading. So you're like, wait a minute, okay, so if it's a security, it's a security of what? Uh, it's not a security of Ripple. You know, it, it doesn't give you the rights to dividends or ownership of Ripple, the company. We, we have shareholders of Ripple, right? We raised a Series A financing, a Series B financing, uh, and we own a lot of XRP, but they're, they're two separate things. At the same time, uh, we've seen recently Block One uh, had the hammer come down on them from regulators. They uh, were uh, basically said that they were selling an unregistered security. And um, them $24 million just. It's interesting you call that a hammer. They raised $4 billion and they. <laughs> yeah, it's a light hammer. hammer. It's a light hammer. hammer. <laughs> you and I have a different judgment. Yeah, yeah, hammer a, maybe it's a fly swatter. It's a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Either way, so what's the difference between Block One and their token EOS uh, versus you know what you guys are working on? Well, I think one really important distinction is the XRP ledger existed before Ripple, the company. You can, you know, it's a public blockchain. You can go back and see kind of transactions zero, one, two, three. You can see when Ripple was incorporated in the Secretary of State in California. Uh, it, Ripple didn't create the XRP ledger. The XRP ledger had utility prior to Ripple's existence. Uh, you know, certainly we are an interested party in the success of the XRP ledger, for sure. We own a lot of XRP. Uh, but it's a little bit like saying, you know, Exxon owns a lot of oil. That doesn't make oil a security. Hmm. Exxon's clearly interested in how to, you know, we can argue about the health of the, you know, I'm not here to debate carbon emissions. <laughs> Climate crisis, <laughs> you want to get into that? Maybe no, this is an example I wanted to choose here. But <laughs> suffice it to say, Exxon cares a lot because they have a lot of exposure to a, in this case, commodity called oil. Is Exxon doing things that are trying to drive a healthy ecosystem around oil? Yeah. You were at our Brainstorm Finance Conference in Montauk great event. in June. Thank you. Um, you. It was the same week that Facebook announced their Libra project. And at the time on stage, you said, you know, this was a great week. You were super happy about it. Now we've seen there's been some backlash from regulators um, with the Libra project, uh, you know, and some doubts from their partners about whether it will proceed. How are you feeling about Libra now? Look, I think anything that's good for the crypto ecosystem is good for Ripple. It's good for XRP, it's good for Bitcoin, it's good for ETH, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, that week was a great week for us because I think the way Facebook announced Libra, and I, I use that, it, rather, I should say, they announced the Libra white paper, uh, is they talked about it in context of, uh, in one particular quote I thought was maybe got a lot of good attention for Ripple, was this idea that, if Libra is successful, it's going to put Western Union out of business. Mm. And I think that was a, a quote by a, a, a Facebook employee. And you know, if you're a financial institution and you hear that, uh, you're like, huh, wait a minute, you're coming after me. Uh, and I think a lot of financial institutions recognize that as you know, digital first companies 
enter financial transactions, it's not going to take three days to settle a transaction up to London. Right? It's, uh, in order to compete on a level playing field, you need to have you know, not just today's set of technologies, but even going forward to tomorrow's set of technologies. And a lot of, particularly for cross-border payments, you know, you're stuck in a technical architecture built 50 years ago. Uh, what Ripple's doing is saying, look, we can take that you know, way beyond uh, where we are today and make it far more efficient. So what happens with Libra and their white paper initiative, uh, I, you know, hard to predict. I think you know, maybe that would have been better received had Facebook not been the point of the arrow. Facebook has been in the crosshairs of a bunch of governments around the world. And I think what we saw happen was, you know, not surprisingly in my opinion, you know, the regulators saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you know, there's a trust issue over here that we're concerned about, and now you want to go into you know, consumer financial services. And again, the way that the initial white paper positioned Libra, the Libra coin, was really as a competitive fiat. Uh, you know, I think that's a different animal than certainly how we think about uh, you know, using XRP and the, the, the role of many digital assets in the future. Are you bullish on Facebook's ability to execute Libra as they originally laid it out in the white paper? No. I, it, by the way, I, I mean, I guess if I parsed your question exactly, do I think they have the technical competency to do that? Sure. But will it happen? I, I think in the regulatory headwinds they're facing, I think, are substantial. And, uh, I, you know, should they have predicted that? I, we can debate that. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, what they have said publicly, I believe, is that they will not, they don't intend to launch anything until they've made regulators comfortable. You know, I've read some of the statements from some regulators, and I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, a tough road. So you don't think it'll happen? If I were a betting man, uh, I, I would take an auger bet uh, on, you know, will Libra, maybe there is actually. A, I don't there know, should be. There should be. If yeah. not, I would bet that uh, Libra, you know, I think there's a time-based element on Augur as well. So I'll say, uh, I'll take the over-under of, you know, let's say t the end of 2022, I think Libra will not have launched. Mm. If there were, if, if Facebook isn't the right company to do this now, given the, you know, regulatory headwinds, is there another company, you know, or organization that you think would be better suited to launch this project? Hey, I don't know. I mean, I think the problem is the genie's a little bit out of the bottle. Mm. Uh, you know, I, if, if, the two of you got together and launched something that wasn't called Libra that looked an awful like that, a lot like that and got you know, some of the same participants to come together, could, would it likely achieve a little more success? Maybe. Uh, I, I think now you know, Libra, at least from a regulatory point of view, has, uh, you know, it's viewed as a Facebook project. I, I know we can debate that, but it, it, the perception is 100% that it's a Facebook project. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. For sure. Hopefully have you back before 2022. We'll <laughs> <laughs> see. Yeah, Brad, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm Jen Vietchner. I'm Robert Hackett. For more Balancing the Ledger, come to Fortune.com. We'll see you next time.